What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Pumped to be talking about the computational renaissance. We have Tristan Tyler Blake joining us on the show. Hi, Tristan. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you again, brother. It's, Likewise. you know, it's been a long time and we've spent so much time together on the phone and just discussing these incredible ideas. So uh, really good time to be here and thank you so much. I look forward Likewise. to this discussion, man. I'm so pumped. And yeah, your background is so epic for this conversation we're about to have. Tristan Tyler Blake is the founder of Machine Learning Society and the Co-Network, which are custom engineered social networks for the acceleration of science, technology, and culture. You can find the links in the bio below to the Computational Renaissance page as well as innovation-labs.co and Tristan's LinkedIn profile. Yeah, we've been going back and forth for quite some time now on ideation around the future and what the best social fabric is that's going to be the most optimal design and architecture of the protocols that manifest the abundant, prosperous future that we're all seeking. Let's start with a couple of our more uh, spiritually inclined questions. Sure. Are we really all one? <clears throat> You know, uh, I, as a person who loves history and literature, uh, I believe we need to rescue a lot of words from mediocrity. And I think uh, in the spiritual realm, you know, I often see that people use the words like uh, uh, quantum and uh, words that are dedicated to science and have a true legitimate uh, meaning. And I feel like uh, they're competing with the scientific one where actually they're just trying to say the same thing from two or even three different perspectives. So are we all one? Uh, do we have a collective consciousness? I actually think we have collective emotions, a new class of emotions that might be emerging, could be from social media, could be from the internet, but there are emotions that come from within internally and then if you have the type of radar that picks that up, an ecosystem intelligence, something that I believe that our species is evolving, uh, then you could pick up external emotions and uh, experiences that are collective to us all. And if the two misalign, well, you get yourself a little bit of um, just friction. And so it's important to have your external emotions or the collective ones and the internal ones um, be compatible. And that's really, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. the key to happiness. Would you say that everything is interconnected? Absolutely, yes. And, uh, you know, I often think uh, in different sciences, kind of, so you're driving down this road and you look down the mountain and you see the sky and you see the trees and that is all an ecosystem and it has its own computational intelligence behind it. Mm -hmm. And there are sciences or fields of exploration inquiry that we don't even know how to ask about or how to question or analyze, but you know, the trees are related to the sky and related to the mountains and uh, the relationships are difficult to identify because there's so many of them. Yeah. And it's about asking the question in the right way. And as, as we talked a little earlier, yeah. every life has uh, 2.5 billion heartbeats, not, not 4 billion. So all those thousands of people that I told before, it's 2.5 actually. 2.5 billion if you live until you're 82. Yeah. There you go. So yeah. if, if, so every life has 2.5 billion heartbeats and I believe a million questions. And what I find as a, as a person that is passionate about data science and algorithms is that it's actually the order in which you ask questions that really defines the outcome. That's right. You know, so yeah. if you ask one question before the other, you get a non-answer. You or you yeah. just you didn't ask the question appropriately. And I think this moment in time, this computational renaissance, this period, this epic period, actually, uh, it's about asking questions, the right questions, in the right order. Yeah, that counts. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And we'll dive into that in a little bit more detail in a little bit. I want to ask you also, what do you think is the purpose of this reality? You know, um, I love the suggestion that there is a purpose. But when I look into the stars and into the sky, I, I, I just feel like the stars are really... The purpose is for stars to live and die and for the universe to live and die. Everything lives and dies. So it's the purpose is to understand what life is, I think, or just to experience life as much as possible. Every flavor, every, um, every type of experience, good and bad, you know. 
uh, and and I often have these experiences at home. I I tell my friends about this, but you know I'll be reading history or or writing something, and it's as if something takes over, and I experience these. Uh, I used to have kidney stones uh, a couple of years ago, and just terrible pain, like eight out of ten pain, you know. But these things, you go down just as hard on your knees, except these are eights of pleasure or of clarity. So I call them seizures of clarity because mm. you go down and you and you see the world and you experience it and you just the types of things that truly enable that kind of experience is to think about numbers or sizes that are overwhelming. That's when I'm triggered. So how many stars in the galaxy or in the universe? Try to think about that, and that will simu that simulation attempt will literally blow your mind. You know, and you could experience uh, what is a billion stars. When people think, of, when I say the word billion, think of a billion stars. You're actually thinking about twenty thousand, fifty thousand, probably. Now multiply and multiply and multiply that. Um, so when I look at a swimming pool, I see a trillion atoms of water, and you know, water just just the molecules interacting. So there's there's kind of a big data way of seeing the world, a perspective. And then there's the actual reality. So I believe, yeah, the purpose is to see the world from all of the different angles um, you know, mm -hmm. and perspectives. Mm. <clears throat> yes, very, very eloquent. I love the way of, of being able to see from these different perspectives, adding into um, a more a clear and true. It's kind of like the purpose of it is to see it from all of these different beautiful angles, to have these profound moments of awakening that that feeling is exactly what this beckons, this reality beckons yeah. for you to feel, for you to be dropped to your knees of mind blowingness yeah. over and over again, every day mind blowingness. You know, I love that. I, I found that uh, when you, so beauty is kind of like a bunny rabbit. It's so fast, they're always so fast. And, and beauty, if, you know, sometimes you see a bunny pop out and you try to get your phone to capture, capture a picture, but the moment you have it ready, the bunny's gone, long gone. Mm -hmm. And beauty is just like that. When, you, when something beautiful is in front of you, you almost don't have time to appreciate it or even identify, truly examine it. Yeah. Right? And, and I think some of the new technologies of perception that we have uh, and subconscious kind of, you know, tweaking or, or understanding your subconscious and actually experiencing it, um, you can now capture reality in real time and explore beauty and then effectively understand the patterns of it so that when you're walking around, you could actually see aspects of that beauty that you captured. Maybe it could be culture, it could be a sound, it could be a shape, it could be a geometry. And then you could apply that to this new beauty and you see it all over again because you've learned to recognize it in the past. So it's kind of funny. The more beauty you see, the more you see it everywhere yeah yeah another one of the feelings for me actually tying in all of the previous questions that i've asked are these feelings of the most deep profound interconnectedness to all that is um and when i experience that feeling it feels like the uh first of all that this is my next question actually to you um have you experienced ego death before and yeah. give us the experiences so i left my ego on the airplane in the, one of the kind of compartments and then I, I forgot to pick it up on the way out uh it was actually when i came to san diego um i sort of i forgot i left it on the flight uh you know i was coming from new york like uh, wall street style you know kind of doing this thing and and i just realized that uh that's that's just not what makes me happy uh what makes me happy is uh, learning about the nature of reality in the universe investigating yes. the conversations between plants yes you know investigating the the size of stars and their relative sizes to each other. Um, these things are just much more interesting to me than, I guess, making money or kind of, you yeah. know, those aspects. Um, Beautiful. So, yeah, that's, I, I experienced ego death a couple of times. And it's when I meet extraordinary people that with profound intelligences and and uh, just just kind of humanity that uh, if you have ego you are missing the opportunity to explore their uh, geometry 
yeah. it, it kind yeah. of it's a blocker yeah. it's a filter yeah on your reality your ego and, and actually i've been telling my team my amazing team that's sitting over there i'd love to talk a little bit about them uh, mm -hmm. later but um when you kind of just experience r reality as as if it was a, a touch screen right here now imagine there's a finger behind somewhere so what if you were just to go back a little bit now look at the screen and you start to understand when you know uh, my work is in uh, computer vision and artificial intelligence the machine learning society i try to look at the world through the lens of a child's eyes like a like a toddler what are the learning patterns um how yeah. is the inter information being interpreted and then you go and you say wait a robot needs to understand what is a person, what is a microphone, what is a computer, what 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 am I potentially yes, later? Yes, yes. So you could start to understand how a robot interprets the world, and that allows you to go. Wait a minute, we are very neuromorphic. So if you just look at your own lens, if you zoom out, you could see all the red and blue circles and uh, indicators, and well, you could actually then decide this indicator goes off and it's red negative but mm -hmm. you might enjoy that or you might actually like it but your actual character or your build your architecture um your scaffolding it doesn't permit for you to experience that uh, with clarity without some noise being introduced by your body so i listen to my um, my mind rather than my body and my and your body is the one that typically adds layers of perception it goes i like this or i don't like that whereas i go no no no. what do i actually like and it's like that touch screen that you could modify your own um weights so i have up your your site mm -hmm. So let's jump into this. There's a couple things that I want to explore here. You started us into this computational um, renaissance. Um, so we have, we have um, this is innovation-labs.co. This is magnetizing intelligence where we, you started giving us these ideas of, of uh, patterns, pattern recognition from, a, from the perspective of a child. When they're born into the world, how do they see the world? Mm -hmm. do they, what inputs are they starting to take in? How are they starting to understand the patterns? Same thing with robots. Same thing with perception. Profound curiosity. Profound curiosity and no. starting to structure. What is most relevant? relevant for them like what are they uniquely blueprinted for to do in this world and then how do they then ask questions about the reality to help them bring what's blueprinted in them forth into the world so <clears throat> so let's have you walk us through a couple of these things there's there's um the ml society co-network um, I want you to to walk us through. There's there's one more thing that I want to showcase as well, which is uh, the computational uh, renaissance as well. So let's show this. So this is on that page. When you click computational renaissance, you dive here. So teach us about the difference between ML Society Co Network, um, computational, and teach us walk us through all this. Sure. Stuff. So uh, you know when when I first came to San Diego, I, I didn't really know. Um, what my future would be there. I sort of came almost to get warm so that I could head off to SF, you know, uh, over here with you guys. But um, the moment I touched down, I just recognized that there was this transformative period, this revolution going on. And, and I, I was always very nostalgic about missing the Einstein, Neil Bohr period where they were uh, kind of cutting the nature of the atom. They were splitting it and understanding it. Uh, and I felt like I had lost an opportunity to be part of an epic period, but the moment I touched down in, in San Diego, I truly experienced this like revival, uh, you know, just this awakening of, of curiosity and, and um, an opportunity. So uh, I started to explore and I wanted to go to UCSD to, to the data science program uh, because I just knew AI was that I knew machine learning was a answer to many questions that we didn't even know how to ask yet. Mm -hmm. And, but my grades were just horrendous. Uh, you know, when I was younger, I had to deal with certain uh, experiences that didn't allow me to focus on my grades or, you know, a lot of other things for that matter. So uh, in San Diego, I, I realized that I wouldn't be able to join any program, but no school should take me really. 
but I, but I still need to learn, you know, I still need to be around uh, this, uh, these people and to absorb their, and understand their um, culture and their civilization that they've engineered. So I started hosting these groups, the Machine Learning Society. There was this moment where, you know, I launched it and the third day there were 60 people that were on the, on the group. And I was like, oh my God, now I have this responsibility to host, to do something to create value for them. Otherwise, I'm wasting their time. So I started hosting these events and, and it started with like these Kaggle competitions, these data science competitions, um, you know, for engineers to kind of collaborate on, on solving um, uh, computer vision problems and uh, natural language processing problems. And I was just learning through that, you know, uh, in real time. Yep. The, the other thing is we would host, uh, I, I just saw that uh, the academic world wasn't really providing a lot of um, experiences for their sciences that allowed them to actually connect. So I started ho hosting hikes with a data scientist, you know, where people can walk and talk about everything, including um, bioinformatics and physics and genomics and all these incredible things. And it was very successful. So I started to scale my ambitions, you know, as, as you do, as you start to see uh, elements of success. And I started hosting larger and larger events until, you know, to our community today, we have about 30,000 impressions, you know, social media and, uh, with our uh, uh, email campaigns and uh, our actual physical community in New York, Boston, San Diego, and uh, one that's growing in the Bay Area. So it... It's just about when you have all these people and all of their attention, how do you actually concentrate it towards outcomes that, that benefit them and create ROI? And that's, I think that's um, a return on inspiration. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. So there was this deep passion from you to get involved in this computational renaissance. You're coming to San Diego, this very Silicon Beach, SoCal-esque LA and San Diego have so much of the cutting edge that's happening. Um, this is very important to keep in mind as a lot of people are just looking at Silicon Valley. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then... Actually, it was gravity. It was gravity. 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 Get pulling you to... And I really mean that when I say gravity. Yeah. I've been exploring this, this external uh, emotion, as we were mentioning earlier. I've really been feeling gravity. And, and something that I kind of just saw was consciousness is gravity. Consciousness is gravitational. It pulls and it can push. Too. Going towards solving these big problems in NLP or computer vision and trying to gather the consciousness to focus on the big problems and to advance the frontier of AI. I like this a lot. So then let's let's start wandering into, you know, you're throwing you're throwing these events, you're throwing these competitions, you're seeing how you can focus consciousness on tackling the big challenges. Now you have communities that have popped up around the world. So let's walk us through the then the differences between um, ML Society Co Network. Sure computational renaissance and we'll showcase them as as you go so from today's lens you know it takes time to truly understand uh context and to uh put things into the proper boxes right um to contextualize them uh in the in the past the uh, machine learning society was just this this um instrument for uh attracting intelligent people so that they can collaborate. It was very effective. Um, but then I hit this scalability function, this, this kind of, I was looking at uh, the Machine Learning Society as a community, and I really didn't know how I could scale that until, uh, it was actually a dream and it was a vision, it was just this uh, moment. And I remember when it happened, um, when I started thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not a community anymore. We've just transitioned. We've just moved into a network. And the moment I started seeing this from a network perspective, uh, it fundamentally uh, changed. The, the transition towards a network allows for scalability. And that's borrowing from data science and uh, complexity theory and all of these new sciences that are profoundly transforming the human condition and, and our experience of it. Um, so the moment I saw it was a network, it freed me to actually scale it uh, pretty much infinitely uh, using the infrastructure of a network. So the Machine Learning Society is a community at the time, 
And then I understood, I started meeting other groups that had a machine learning society class problems. So if you think of a community as an egg, right, with a, with, you know, some sort of uh, uh, embryo inside, I started thinking, what would an egg carton look like or, or something that could incubate these uh, communities and turn them maybe into networks when they hatch? So the egg carton would be co-network, which is essentially an infrastructure for network design, for networks to operate. Mm -hmm. And they, the, if you think of it, almost any community or network as a brain, uh, you start to see each one of them requires... Uh, communications infrastructure, event management, jobs and security like that, storytelling, right? Yeah. Um, um, just culture, right? Culture is a technology. Mm -hmm. So all of these different aspects are absolutely necessary for any healthy community to, to exist and to continue to, uh, you know, operate. Flourish, yeah. And, and that's what co-network was for me. It was this kind of, how do I build a templated infrastructure for any community to expand and to operate on this new paradigm of just connectivity, collaboration, uh, communication, so... Yeah, I love that. I love being able to, like you said, focus in consciousness on tackling the big challenges, um, especially around the future of artificial intelligence. And then you went and gave us this example of how you need all of these different pillars. Um, I, like, I like your brain more. Of, <laughs> I like your brain now. I'm going to use that. I'm going to borrow I like, that. I love this a lot. Yeah, because there's all these different pillars of the network design and the environment um, for the community that can maximize the flourishing of it. I love that a lot. It's okay. a system. Think of things as systems. Every system requires certain parts, and if you could systematize uh, almost anything, and that's a technology that we're uh, developing now, and we're going to be, um, you know, releasing shortly to the general public. But if you can create systems that uh, that that capture these patterns and and replicate them pretty much infinitely, right? AWS. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what it is. It, mm -hmm. It's design a pattern and then scale it uh, to, to as much as your ambition allows. So uh, yeah, the, there's a certain, I guess. What people need to appreciate is there's a, if you put enough energy and uh, infrastructure behind something, there's kind of a tipping point towards inevitability, mm -hmm. and you need to know how to understand and simulate that. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think your simulation uh, uh, storytelling is actually uh, a lot in line with that uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of it actually does have to do with, like you said, this building out this, this, this network design to maximize the focus of consciousness on tackling the problems. And then one of the big pillars is, yeah, the story. Why are people doing it? Um, how can we optimize the galvanizing process of people's spirits in order to get them going towards a given goal? You sent me over a computational renaissance. So after you go to... Um, on the uh, innovation-labs.co, once you get here, you click computational renaissance on the left, and then it takes you over to the computational renaissance page. Yeah. So when you were explaining this to me, it was really beautiful because I started seeing things structured data, basically. Yeah. I was like, structured data. And like yeah. you look at the column on the left, and there's... Uh, Hello World, Curiosity Tracks, Master Takes, Cities, Events, Lectures, Books, Podcasts, Institutes, Boot Camps, Jobs, Initiatives, Signals, Videos, etc. And when you click through those, you can find incredible events based on machine learning in San Diego or in Boston or whatever. There's so many different ways to categorically parse and find the data that you're looking for. And I love this. So teach us about what you're doing here with this computational renaissance uh, platform. And in a sense, it's like a really beautiful way to structure data and make it easy accessible. So there's actually a, a really funny story uh, behind this. Uh, I, I, in my, my apartment in San Diego, I call it the Habitat. And I effectively invite people to just call me up and go, I'm in town and uh, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you, I, I want to share something. Um, and I'm like, okay, I, I keep this antenna open for interesting fascinating people uh, and and it worked uh, you know one some some gentleman he he called me and he's like hey i'm i'm in san diego and i was told i should uh, meet you and you know you do this a lot as well so uh and he just came over and we started chatting we you know we hung out and i shared with him my one note document that organized all of my uh, dreams and stories and uh, 
uh, memories and kind of all, all this stuff. And he's like, dude, this would look great on this software suite, uh, Coda, actually, mm-hmm. uh, and Coda.io. And I'm like, all right, what, you know, what, what is that uh, kind of? I, so I wrote it down. I, I make sure that every opportunity that flies by, I have a, a, a way to capture it, right? Like that bunny. Yes. You need to be ready for the bunny, the beauty. You mm-hmm. need to be prepared to capture it right away and examine it so that you could see it everywhere. Uh, so I wrote it down right away. And, and you know, that the moment that I did it, I was standing at my standing table and it was just a profound experience. And I wish people can go through a similar um, experience. You know, I, I think it's a, it's fundamental. It's probably the same feeling you get the first time you use Google. Mm-hmm. Maybe even the first time you're going to ask a AI a question and it's going to give you an answer that is coming from a, something, from a brain. Right? Everybody, hopefully, is going to experience that one day uh, soon. But... Uh, you know, I was standing there at my standing table and it felt when I started using the software, I saw the future in front of me, that just this incredible visual, you know, uh, this reverie. And the moment that I saw everything, it felt like the ground had just collapsed under my feet. It, it left, it disappeared. And I felt like I was flying. No ground, just flying. And I realized right there that a lot of people who are, I guess, from a depressive disposition, um, you know, or the kind of those types of repertoires, they would experience like they're falling. But I felt like I'm flying. And I, I mm. simply realized that flying is simply falling forward in physics. And that was kind of the, the experience. And I wish people experienced that flying feeling of just weightlessness and, and momentum pushing them towards, uh, uh, you know, their passion or their just what is calling them that gravity so yeah it's yeah to be able to capture the profundity of ideas or of beauty and then be able to organize it in a way that can recall or they can share with other people is so critical and so yeah go ahead, yeah. Go ahead. So, so this system uh i'm sort of my halloween costume going forward is going to be database man mm. <laughs> mm-hmm. i really love databases i think they're beautiful I, they had all there's like starfish databases they're different designs and the, there's exotic formats um and if you organize data a certain way you really get a incredible kind of clarity and insight into this information and you can you can see it from different perspectives and um you know so this system that you saw over there that's uh, I need it for myself. I built it for me in order to have an ecosystem intelligence to see every company in uh, in, the, in North America, China, and Europe, yeah. and South America a little bit. Um, I needed to see that, yeah. right? So that I could by tag understand what are the op- what's the opportunity matrix. Um, some of the other distributions that I've designed uh, have been for personal kind of management of my reveries or my memories, my thoughts, my experiences, my writing. Uh, almost like a four-dimensional book for data. And you could jump in, you could write something, tag it up, and then you could fly around in your thoughts. It's a powerful experience and and I think a necessary one to truly understand the tags that hold your information, your ideas. There's certain buckets and, and templates and themes that you're constantly cycling through. And if you could let them out, externalize your um, uh, ideas and the things that swirl around, you actually get to see them for what they are and examine them and, and use them with context. And, and, uh, yeah. and, the, and the social network that we were mentioning earlier, the co-network, uh, that's actually also an externalization or a um, digitization of my personal relationship network. So it's got, I guess there's a theme here, right? It's digitizing and externalizing your experiences and emotions and uh, networks and relationships in order to truly uh, interpret them, understand them and leverage them to create and, and, um, and inspire. 
Yeah. When, when I hear you talking about like being in love with databases, being in love with the visualization of, of data and the process of structuring it and making it relatable, externalizing my consciousness into some sort of a visual that I can go and recall more easily the most profound things. Of course, we were talking about this beforehand, but there's so many ways to do this. This is with your big network of contacts. This is with all of your ideas and your execution roadmap. There's all different ways to do this. And so, you know, how do we optimize that process of taking in that data, structuring it, visualizing it, and creating a feedback loop of your process of actualizing your, your vision into the world? This is extremely important to figure out. I'm so glad that you're super um, focus on this. And this is actually, you were using this word data metabolism, which I really yeah. like because we've been using also data refining. Mm -hmm. And I think they're so, so similar. Um, the process of now that data silos are no longer, they're breaking down in, in many ways. Decentralization mm -hmm. is, is moving forward. There's so many good ways to be able to find like right now, just take this example of your data that's in your Google calendar, data that's in your Google contacts, data that's in your Evernote or OneNote or Keep or whatever you're using for your note-taking mm -hmm. service. There's no harmonization between that data as for you to further be able to mm -hmm. gain profound insights, visualize, even in your networks, like you have all these, you know, your Facebook, Twitters, Instagrams, LinkedIn's, etc. The The ownership of the data being on their end and the limit of when do you ever get a beautiful data visualization of your own network and the people that you can get in touch with that will help you accelerate yeah. what you're doing, all this type of stuff. These are things that we're super passionate about seeing in the future of the data renaissance and the computational renaissance. Mm -hmm. So data metabolism, uh, you know, I've been using that word to... I've been seeing a phenomenon. I'm as an anthropologist, uh, self-trained. Uh, I, I would say um, obsessively. I'm an obsessive uh, anthropologist. So I didn't go to school for it. I just want to kind of make sure everybody knows that. But I have another training. It's called obsession for culture and civilization anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, I started noticing that a lot of my friends and a lot of the people around me were flooded with data, too much, t too much information, TMI, and they were unable to self-actualize because there was just so much data to process on a daily basis, like so many texts and this and that, and you got to do this and that. And people started to almost slow down rather than speed up. I just saw a, a tremendous drop in productivity. And I was like, wait a minute, this phenomenon, I, I, I need to I need to jump over it and experience it first so that I could create templates for others to use. It's and so I, interesting that becoming more interconnected actually could decrease productivity if absolutely. we're not careful about how right. we... Yeah, so that, that data metabolism, I mean, that's a maturity. It requires maturity, the most important word of the 21st century, by the way. Um, so that maturity with data, really like using your cell phone as a, as a tool and a vehicle to achieve your, uh, uh, you know, dreams mm -hmm. rather than just being this um attention kind of gathering thing i, I believe in con uh, not in attention economies but concentration economies where you focus and uh, habits and focus are a technology in my opinion and yeah. that's something that some of the networks that we're building are designed to amplify and uh you know really target kind of what do you want to do and, and send you towards that yep. uh at with with momentum so yeah data metabolism you know you really need to be kind of careful to get rid of all of the dings and pings and make sure all of this information that you're gathering uh is being used and relevant so it's really as it you need, everybody needs to become a data scientist yep. in order not to be overwhelmed with data that's potentially unnecessary interesting everyone becomes a data scientist so that you can manage the fire hose of data that's being shot into your face every single day yeah. some of us have better data metabolism than others like i can remember almost everybody i've ever met and i can recall people and faces and all that stuff uh, but my memory is very different you're and parsing for signal for your personal blueprint yeah absolutely yeah. so you could engineer these uh, data um, centers for your personalized data centers essentially uh, to recall uh, almost anything and I, and I often tell people why remember anything when you could remember everything and the way you do that is you externalize your memory and you leave so much space inside to actually compute rather than hold ram 
and, and there's just a, yeah i mean it's been called an existential technology by some people yeah. it really allows us a, a, a single person to organize complexity it's so funny when <laughs> i'm in a conversation i go hold on a second i need to get my computer and then yeah. i go and i offload all of the profound things i've been capturing onto the, mm -hmm. in off of ram into um long-term storage and yeah. then i just go right back into focusing on trying to make the profound connections with the other person and not focusing so much on the storage as well yeah. of the data right you know uh yeah we're in this period right now where this form factor of uh, the phone it's like your attention has to be diverted and uh you're you always have to be kind of uh going to your computer to truly capture the context but uh, some of my friends and some of the things that i'm working on are going to allow you to be present and to truly um just be while this thing is ambiently um, collecting your information. Good luck with finding what's most profound to that person. You have to know that person's personal blueprint. You have to know what they want to parse for, and then you ambiently have to capture it. Actually, but th this is all possible. Actually, it's of course all possible. That's th so my exercise was a really big risk. I took like three months to experiment and do this and it was at great risk because that was a very valuable time period where uh, i need my data kind of prepared or else my business and my relationships are gonna you know suffer and uh but i took this this leap of faith to basically go i'm gonna try a totally alternative approach just unconventional altogether uh in order to see if there's a unfair advantage that i can get through technology and then once i've templated it uh, and given it to all of my friends, uh, I can uh, then uh, pr reproduce it for the rest of the world. And w one of the things that people should uh, appreciate right now is just with even social networks, the one that we're building, you can actually architect a single master kind of template and then you could infinitely replicate it. Yeah. And you could actually focus that network's attention on people that love bicycling mm -hmm. or podcasting mm -hmm. right and you could tweak the parameters and yes. the um yes. uh, actually the the culture and anthropology you could reverse engineer anthropology so when most people go to burning man or one of these uh, events you know I, I i go to them but as an event organizer uh, I, I actually i'm experiencing them in order to reverse engineer some of the cultural uh perspectives that i see there and some of the anthropology that i see and i can apply that culture or applied anthropology so this is uh, the people that are involved in humanities and civilization and art and all that stuff this is really where they turn on um and if they could just understand how to use databases they can create incredible resource systems for their communities and for their families and their friends. Yeah. And they could um, basically just scale, which is their consciousness. There's all of these uh, yeah, applications of these personalized ways to focus consciousness on these given tasks and all you have to have all these pillars that you're talking about earlier no. that help, you know, you're given this one recently, this, um, this uh, understanding of anthropology and culture and the dynamics there to help push along that focused consciousness. I love your push on that. And it's so interesting too. There's all of these different um, focuses on these on these little like butterfly uh, um, uh, protocol uh, consciousness focuses, mm -hmm. genomics, IoT, autonomous cars, 5G technology, super intelligence, blockchain, all different aspects of this. It's just is endless just mention some of my favorite buzzwords exactly <laughs> and it's just and these are the things that you can you're creating these little pockets of that are happening around the world in different areas yeah you know um i just think right now this period this computational renaissance is a moment to ask bigger questions uh and these periods these epic periods actually um they arise when there's an existential uh, risk to a species. So uh, I'm a big uh, kind of, uh, I'm a very passionate about ancient Greek history and Roman mythology and all this stuff. And I find that these epic periods are really just for humans, we transition in those periods. Yeah. And we ask bigger questions because we finally have reached a point where we now have the ability to answer it. And, and, uh, you know, the 1970s were and before we used to understand and manage capital. 
the years after that, the next 10, 20 years, uh, Google came through and it was able to manage information. Uh, I think Amazon has just arrived on the scene to manage computation, mm. you know, and, and now we've just solved that problem. And I think the next few questions are really going to be about consciousness, understanding that, and that this, we're all leading to the same point, that same intersection. We're just asking it in very different languages and accents, and but we're all leading to that very fundamental question, which I, I think you asked in the beginning, kind of, are we all one uh, consciousness? I think we're all engineering a single consciousness and we're transitioning almost the same way that uh, hunter gatherers you know uh, well, hunt uh, went to kind of farm and uh, living you know in these uh, small villages and then these villages transformed into towns and then towns went into cities and then super cities and then megalopolis and now uh, our first summit in uh, San Diego uh, not our first summit but our Q1 summit uh, is uh, called synthetic infrastructure and that's about um, t turning a city into an organism a brain uh, that manages all the infrastructure and uh, the water and you know um, um, resilience for earthquakes and fires uh, this is really a thinking system a city that uh, thinks and communicates a networked city and I mean, you know, between you and me, I believe that San Diego is small enough to prototype these solutions and then rapidly propagate them to other cities around the world. I think there's a city to city, C to C model uh, happening right now where you want to buy a port. Sure. Uh, we can sell you this USB stick. You want to buy an airport? Same thing. It's on another USB stick if it fits right. So you can now understand infrastructure and template it again, getting back to that templating one time template and then iterating or improving upon that template uh, over and over and over again until you have uh, a, a finished version. This is 3D printing, uh, uh, but of ide scaffolding ideas. It's, it's quite a remarkable technology, and I encourage everyone to try. <laughs> so the Synthetic Infrastructure Summit that's coming up in the Q1 of 2020. Yeah, uh, March 12th and 13th. Yeah. March 12th, 13th to 2020 in San Diego. You're basically identifying all of the different data that's happening inside of a city and you're structuring data, turning it into an actual brain, an actual more functional brain that's able to produce what San Diego's goals are, what Denver's goals are, what London's goals are, Tel Aviv's goals that are. That is consciousness from a city perspective. A city can be conscious yeah. if you give it a brain. If you give it a brain. And so a nervous system. And, and the nervous, nervous system, system is the IoT and the edge computing. The edge computing. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. recently yeah. came from a meeting with uh, Intel. We were actually um, doing a video uh, podcast. So I hope to have that up in a couple of weeks. We're producing a cool uh, uh, scre uh, screening, but um, you know, they really talked about some fascinating kind of approaches to uh, engineering edge computing. And just to describe what that really means, it's actually the paradigm before was this cloud model where you would ask a question, or a car would see a camera. Uh, you know, the camera would see something. I'll go, I see something. It would go up the wire and into the cloud, and then the big computer somewhere, some supercomputer, some data center would answer that question computationally and they would send an answer back and just like the brain i mean wow that's a lot of time spent transferring from here to here even though it's a small distance um when it comes to uh neuroscience or when it comes to biology and the nervous system these split seconds are the difference between life and death the difference between an accident or just a, a shift in in traffic a calib recalibration so this new move towards edge computing is, is really founded on this understanding of the brain and, and neuroscience and, and neuromorphic computing. You know, so actually San Diego has uh, some of the leading research at the Salk Institute uh, on, on brains. And uh, I guess that's really, I don't know, one of the most exciting areas. If you're, if you're into um, neuroscience and cognitive sciences, that's re you're really positioning yourself to not only understand, but to... explore and pass through this world in a, in a way that you can actually experience it just 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 a new way you really get to see the world in a profound way and that's our second conference uh, our summit q2 um 50 uh, shades of gray matter you got it yeah. okay so 50 explain shades this. of gray matter yes uh computational neuroscience behavioral psychology uh i, I fundamentally believe that 
we're transitioning again, again, hunter gatherer, you know, to, to this farm, to the city, to this biological structure, this megalopolis turned into an organism. Um, with the nervous system as the highways and the tunnels and the sewers being reinforced with the new technology. Um, well, synthetic as uh, 50 shades of gray matter is really our mind and the wiring behind that. Uh, with some of these new softwares, you're really able to go into your subconscious and understand how your neurons are, are firing. You could feel it. You can go in, you can control the screen, the touch screen behind the screen. And you could add your own weights. Again, if you're, if you're building a machine that can interpret the world through computer vision, just apply it to yourself and now you have a mathematical logic layer. You could see the world in math or in waves. You could see it in particles. You could see it in, uh, in colors. You could, you could really choose which focus you want and which kind of vision you want and you could apply that and there you go. It's human vision, computer vision. So it's, it's quite astounding. So Fifty Shades of Grey Matter, I, Yuval Noah Harari, if you're listening to this, please, please, please come and speak there. Uh, <laughs> you know, these we are, love him, yeah. I, I, I love that guy. Um, I think his One books of the are best on point. One of our time, yeah. Yeah, please read yeah. that, uh, Sapiens, uh, yeah. 20, uh, 21 yeah. questions for the 21st. Yeah, questions, just know yeah. that. If you know that, you're on the right track. So um, and some of these speakers that are going to be there and some of the questions we're asking, I mean, you know, what is the future of, of our species and how do our brains evolve from here? How do we make that decision collectively? Uh, because uh, I don't want to leave people behind. I mean, it's necessary to adapt, but, uh, but you will be left behind if you're not able to, uh, to, re, to, to tweak your brain and to create kind of new ways of seeing things and to be adaptive and to be hyper, you know, just... To see opportunity and beauty in everything is, is, is a superpower. And, and I, I think it's necessary to understand yourself, self-reflect, and then to understand others and to yep. learn how to find beauty in others. So, and that's why I continue to, to hang out with you because Likewise. there's tremendous beauty inside of you. And I, and I see it you know, so much that it's, it's, it's radiating. So thank you. Thank you. Likewise. And so then what would you recommend then given all of the computational renaissance that you just listed? What would you recommend as a skill for young people and adults going into this computational renaissance era? You know, I'm, I feel really. So this trip uh, right now, I'm on a trip with my team to uh, to San Francisco and we, we hit up some of the major companies out here to have these uh, awesome conversations about uh, how we can collaborate and you know, all of that is going very well. Uh, but I came here personally, my trip plan, my goal for this trip was to conquer a fear, a single fear. Every trip, every journey must conquer one fear. So a lot of viewers or you, you might think that I'm very comfortable in front of the camera and today I am, but this is at a very different, uh, uh, I used to have a lot of uh, stage fright, like a lot. And I mean, um, a nervous response that would constrict the throat and would create this kind of, I was too afraid to raise my hand in class a long time ago. And it, just to move from there to there on all these fears, to fear everything at least once, everything from ghosts to the dark, to relationships to women, everything was a fear at one point. And I've kind of become an expert at overcoming fears. So this particular trip is about overcoming the fear of cold. I came here and I walked around the redwood forest with shorts on and it was fucking freezing. But I came here to win against the cold and to experience it and to use my own weights. I, I know what my body feels about the cold. Wim Hof it. Yeah. Exactly. I know what my body feels. I feel you. But I said, wait a minute, let, my, um, let me make my own heuristics and let me tweak my own parameters. So that was this journey. And I think every single journey, every relationship, every uh, expedition, and I think you should take expeditions today, um, is about conquering a certain fear. So my goal for every podcast and every media and content that I produce is to push a single person out there, one person, push them towards their goal and help them remove a blocker and just overcome a single fear that's holding them back from whatever it is that they decided to do. That's, you know, dude, Love just it. one person. It's if I can get you, let's go. Exactly. Yeah. 
No. So, so can that, we inspire people? Can we awaken them? Can we help them get towards their goals? Yeah. Yeah. So just push a single person, yeah. and that person will push ten others uh, exactly. over time. Butterfly effect, baby. So yeah, I love it. What are your thoughts on free will? Do we have it? Is this all determined? Got to ask Sam Harris about that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, free will, that's a good question. And uh, my team has taught me to answer, I don't know, <laughs> uh, over this last trip. Free will. You know, um, am I free to do what I'm doing? I think your architecture, um, your neural architecture decides kind of what you're probabilistically going to do. And then it's your choice to choose out of the billions of little subconscious uh, um, kind of things coming up, bubbling up. Your, your experience and training and, and history will decide on which three or four are probably uh, the best options and then you i guess decide which one of those three you'll take uh, you'll you'll you know uh, apply but i think you always i think we actually experience a million different desires at the same time and then our consciousness or subconscious uh, in, in our subconscious and then the, it's somewhere in the city of the mind you know it, we, that all bubbles up I guess really the, the thing that I look at this, when I look at kind of that neuron, uh, the, there's a way to, most people's brains and, and subconscious, they treat it as if it's a um, surveillance system. Their consciousness is a surveillance system of their subconscious. Hey you, where do I find the answer? Give it to me now. So I just tried to answer that question and I went into my subconscious with my consciousness and I went, you better give me an answer. And I scanned the entire neuron city for answers and some tried as hard as they could, like, here, here you go, here you go. But it's really about knowing where to look inside that architecture that always gives you the best answers. Mm -hmm. Which part of your subconscious always gives you the best experiences and emotions and feelings? And that's where you got to look for answers. So do we have a free will? I think we have the freedom to select which part of our consciousness or subconscious provides the answer. Okay. And then do you think that humanity is a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence? Meaning, are we here in order to bring on the next thing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that... Um, I think that we are just designed in a way, architected in a way, uh, through evolution, to always continue to ask deeper questions and to always push kind of chip the rock a little further to see what's behind it. So if I told you that behind this huge stone, there is, you know, a uh, something hidden there inside the rock, uh, I, I guess people, uh, obsession, people with obsession like me have to keep chipping at the rock in order to see what's behind it. Mm -hmm. And I'll spend my whole life on it. And mm -hmm. you, you don't even have to pay me to do that. I'll actually mm -hmm. just do it on my own time, mm -hmm. you know. I'll just keep chipping away. And if AI is behind that, then so be it. Um, but I think, I think you need to have maturity to chip at the right rocks. Yeah, you said this was a, the most important word of the 21st century. I thought yeah. this was in interesting. Yeah. yeah, maturity, you know, I guess uh, maturity, that's what, that's what levels you up. Like when you have a maturity towards a certain concept or subject or like even public speaking, there's a maturity that comes with practice and with doing it. So, so there's a maturity with building super intelligence. There's a maturity with building super intelligence. And this thing could answer all of our questions one day or it could bring about our greatest nightmares one day. Um, and it's really about, I think, giving the people that have shown the most responsibility in the past and that have the highest levels of maturity in politics and science in technology, the people that have demonstrated true leadership and courage, they're the ones that should be given the freedom to chip away and to stop when it's necessary 
and to choose the rocks that we chip or to choose the kind of you know that medium that the, whatever's behind there the way that we birth out of the egg yolk that is the planet yeah the way that the tree grows out of the planet yeah i think we need to be more a lot more selective on the people that are that we hold responsible um get rid of the deep state listen you know conspiracy <laughs> conspiracy is, how do you feel about that is there a global ruling elite tristan um most likely but 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 uh but i, I so actually i mean i've met a lot of these people um the answer is no they're not in control because uh, I understand the limits of some of their uh, perspectives and intelligences. So I, I've evaluated some of these people. I personally don't think that uh, they're, they have that capability. Technically, um, even financially, they, they kind of can't control everything like that. Um, and also, in order to do that, you truly need to be a super anthropologist or AI anthropologist to truly be able to control because there's so much complexity in the system so many dynamic moving parts that mm -hmm. uh, the fact that one person or a group of people could truly model out all of the different complexities that happen as a result of tiny changes in the emergent uh, you know tiny changes create extraordinarily emergent properties that would you're assuming that what they do outcomes the way that they want it the way that they expect it, and that almost never happens. Just to give you an idea of the assets that people own, um, these are such as the um, Passuere family, the Rothschild family, Rockefeller family, Astor family, DuPont family, etc. All these different bloodlines of uh, the ancient um, lineages of the planet. Let's give um, these. Let's give their assets just to give you an idea of what is in control, like mm -hmm. a big game of Monopoly. Railways, banks, cotton sewing machines electric and power gold and silver iron and steel motor vehicle companies insurance companies tobacco companies watch companies land and real estate companies food and household goods and that's only a very small portion of what is actually owned and that's not even getting into the actual nuance of the names of all of the assets in those categories mm -hmm. but just to give you an idea of when you do kind of own a vast majority of the resources and of the um the exactly what's going on on the planet yeah um that's just a food for thought you know it's funny i mean um i i so i used to work in the family office space and helping uh, family offices uh acquire all these real estates and uh, uh companies and all that stuff that's part of my background and i attend these events oftentimes and i meet these people and honestly they're sweet incredible people that manage just m massive fortunes um they're just people they're human they don't really have this extra i mean they don't have this conspiratorial kind of spirit to them they, they want sex and love and and of course there's a little bit of power involved but more uh, important than how much money you have is how did you earn that money I, I think so did you step on people's backs and shoulders and throats along the way or did you bring some sort of a very powerful value to the world that actually inspired more people's blueprints to be actualized and that's a very thin and hard line to parse and understand um, but to do it with the most purity and the mm -hmm. highest intention um, of the maximization of prosperity on the planet that's a very important first principle to have otherwise yep. you have so many of the root issues do you think that one of the root issues of all of the things that are going on in the world is our lack of of interconnectedness the fact that we lack feel so separate from each other and from nature and from reality from all that is i think it's a lack of maturity i think as a species we just haven't matured collectively yet i mean we're still having wars and stuff over really um not important things honestly it's just uh, there's better ways to collaborate uh most people have this paradigm of competition that's kind of one of my little um uh when i think of silicon valley i think of competition and uh but uh, my um I, I believe the new approach to competition is actually competing to collaborate mm -hmm. if you, there's almost like the super colony approach to that mm -hmm. um, i study ants and all these other species and super colonies are a very effective form of competition that's competing to collaborate uh that's, that's the d dynamic that i'm most uh, inspired by and the one that i operate on yeah and it's almost like instead of being a shark you're a jellyfish swarm mm -hmm. you know so there's this different yeah, paradigm yeah. of 
fluidity and uh, you know I invite people to compete to collaborate with each other because That's like uh, this that we were talking about earlier yeah, yeah. It, you you just I don't think being um, a silo or a shark today in the ocean just way too much light you can be seen and uh, you, you you know you, you're you don't synthesize well you don't uh, mm-hmm. Uh, there's just too much inefficiency in having a shark body in this new water. I have a lot of water metaphors. Yeah, so. millenn- millennials and Gen Z are sniffing out uh, corruption quite quickly. Um, yeah. So that's um, quick questions. Uh, last two on the way out. Are we in a simulation? Maybe. I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I don't find that question to be um, particularly uh, kind of. It, it doesn't bring me to the place of uh, exploration. Um, I think there's uh, ways to explore simulation. Like I like chemical simulations or physics simulations, right? These high-performance computers that could simulate chemo- chemoinformatics, uh, that could simulate quantum computing uh, kind of uh, you know phenomena. That's really a simulation, in my opinion, a mathematical simulation. You could simulate the way that uh, one um, pharmaceutical interacts with different uh, med- you know, uh, uh, bodies and, ge- and genetic uh, codes. So for me, simulation belongs there as a word. When it comes to the simulation of an actual um, reality, uh, I do like to think about reality in the engine room of reality and kind of going in and playing with the knobs. Um, so is it a simulation? I, I guess I don't know enough about that particular um, mm-hmm. question to actually be able to interpret uh, to, to actually be able to feel what that what simulation means. I, I guess I'm uh, maybe ignorant of the of mm-hmm. the whole context behind it. What would you say is the most beautiful thing in this reality? That's a good one. Curiosity. Why? You know, it's just, it's the starting point for everything. It's, it's, what is that? Why is that? How is that? It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's a, it's a basis for questions, for asking questions. If you have a million questions and you ask them in the right order, you can actually get a few answers out of it and you get to see the world and, and experience it for what it really is and taste every flavor and, uh, you know, meet all the people. Um, I, I kind of have this little theory that there's like 20,000 people around the world that make it spin. Right? I mean, realistically. And uh, I want to meet all these 20,000 and explore how they do it and uh, learn and interact with them. So, you know, 20, a, a Pareto principle, 20, 80, 80, 20. So my goal is to, yeah, just to uh, experience people. I fell in love with people again. I used to, be, I used to hate people. Seriously, seriously. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm very honest about that. Um, the way I grew up and some of kind of my upbringing, there's, uh, that's, a, that's a thing that I've uh, re- reconciled a lot of those contradictions and, and traumas. Uh, but now I've learned to love people and to see inside of them uh, beauty and the architecture and kind of their unique geometries. And uh, I, I guess, yeah, love for people is one of the most beautiful things to appreciate to be curious about people i guess is to love them really uh, that that's how i would put it so it's a curiosity directed as a laser towards something but you need to sometimes you're a flashlight and sometimes you're a fucking laser and you point it at a question that's worth solving yeah um and if you were if you're fortunate enough to have people around you that illuminate this darkness with flashlights you can act as a laser and when they need a little light for their laser. You turn, you open that laser into your flashlight and you shine it towards the place that they're trying to... Love it. You know, so that's teamwork. That's collaboration. That's... Uh, yeah. I, I think that's the most... Imp- that's one of the most important things that we need to figure out as a species because, man, do we need to explore more cave systems and yeah, more yeah. stars. Curiosity and collaboration and making the right ecosystems around that exploration or process yeah that was very beautifully 
eloquently put throughout the episode and leveraging the computational renaissance that we have now to structure the data and to build the right brain cities to make it happen, all this type of stuff, to get back to some of those roots of interconnectedness uh, and embed that style of, of feeling and emotion and awareness into um, the future that we're building is paramount as we move forward. Otherwise, the tree grows too crooked, too much suffering. We can grow it with more beautiful flowering along the way. Yeah. So this I, is, I, yeah. yeah. I think I think that this is this is a kind of one of those uh, feelings that I, I want to share. Like I have this kind of emo, internal emotion to 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 share this, but. Uh, uh, I think right now during this computational renaissance, so these periods are, are extremely rare in history. Like most people never have a chance to to see light. It's almost like sunlight coming out of very, very uh, shaded clouds, you know. And these there's p- periods and moments and places. Uh, most co- computational cognitive revolutions happen in, in a very isolated place and with a very short, limited period of time. Uh, I I know for a fact there's one going on in San Diego right now. Kind of this era where it's an epic period uh, with heroes and villains to a certain extent um and heroes and monsters right um but at the same time uh this is a period that it's almost like you're not allowed to be angry or upset it doesn't matter who you were before the revolution or the renaissance it's about who you're becoming that's mm-hmm. the real question here so whatever your baggage your story your ego all these things that you've held on to actually don't matter at this line at this point in the sand it. they don't matter going forward you could drop them drop the anger the the fears you know just drop the all of those things that you believe, all of this, the write a new mythology, write your own new mythology. I think that's just an opportunity. These epic periods, they are for writing mythologies. So uh, if you respect the, the ancients, uh, you know, this is a period to write a new mythology for yourself, for your civilization, for your city. And uh, yeah, um, just go out there, meet other people and, and create. That's, that's my message. Yeah, I love it. Wow. This has been such an epic conversation, Tristan. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Super honored to have you on. Thank you. It's a big pleasure. Thank you so much. I love what you're doing, man. And uh, yeah, I support it any way that I can. Thank you. Come to San Diego and uh, I look forward to uh, introducing you to some people and would love to share some ideas. I love Silicon Beach. I love (laughs) San Diego and LA. There's so many smart people down there. I love it. This has been such a great conversation. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about the computational renaissance, about all of these different ways to structure the way we metabolize data and the way that we execute leveraging network theory and design. And also all these other thoughts about just the what's written on uh, innovation-labs.co, computational renaissance. Check out those links in the bio below. Also Tristan's LinkedIn profile. Check that out as well. And then thank you, Ori, for co-producing. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you to the team. Thank you to the and team. And thanks to Tristan's team that's here. We love you guys all. Thank oh, you yeah. very much. We're the homies. Yeah, Shout you guys out. are amazing. Um it's amazing to have people that are from a different angle than you. I always thought that it was supposed to be people just like me. No, 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 no. You actually have to have people that are very different, but compatible. That's just a little lesson for teamwork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. And then also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the uh, organizations, your communities that you believe in, support them and help them grow. You can find all of our links in the bio below. You can support Simulation. You can find us on PayPal, Cryptocurrency, Patreon. All those links are in the bio below. You can also design a cool merchant and get paid. Check all those links out. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. <laughs> awesome, dude.